work out. Actually, we'll, we've still got a few people coming in. So I just half, half one and two. So join the half one and two. Half one. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to um, herbicides, how they affect pollinators, and what we can do. If I can ask people to turn off their um, speakers, please. My name is Tanya St. Pierre, and I'm your compare for this afternoon. I think we still might have a few more people joining, um, but I'll carry on. Um, I'm project manager for Cumbria Wildlife Trust Get Cumbria Buzzing Project, who this week is hosting a, a range of activities and webinars as part of our Big Buzz Week to raise the profile of pollinators. Cumbria Wildlife Trust is lead organisation for Get Cumbria Buzzing Project, which includes 11 partners whose logos you can see on the welcome slide in front of you. And everyone involved in the project is uh, extremely excited today uh, to share this topic for discussion with you. Um, and some of our partners are actually here this afternoon to discuss their position and their experiences. And now Get Cumbria Buzzing aims to promote pollinators and working together with our partners, we aim to, we are actually creating restoring wildflower habitat along main roads and public spaces, specifically for pollinators in Northwest Cumbria. We're also delivering a range of public engagement events, working with schools, communities and volunteers, encouraging and helping them taking, to take action for pollinators. The project is funded in part by Highways England and National Lottery Heritage Fund, amongst others. Now, the story behind this webinar is that we and our partners have an ongoing commitment to manage the community sites and green spaces for both pollinators and the general public into the future. And it's no secret that pollinators are in decline. And besides creating pollinator friendly habitat, we're also looking at other ways that we can help reverse pollinator decline. So the aim of this webinar is to look at the current scientific research around herbicides and its effect on pollinators and to explore the current use of herbicides. We've invited a, a, a range of uh, guest speakers here today from a variety of organisations, not just conservation organisations or charities, but also local authorities, Highway to, Highways England and Tivoli from the cons uh, construction industry to discuss their approaches um, and issues. And as a result, um, what we hope to do is to draw together some best practice approaches for herbicide use uh, when managing green spaces or indeed our own gardens at a time when government is currently reviewing their strategy. So before we start, um, if I could just ask um, that throughout the time that the, our speakers are talking, if you could just mute um, your, um, uh, your sound, please. Um, there'll be opportunity for question and answer at the end of the webinar, so please post any questions that you have in the chat box and we'll run through them at the end. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to our uh, first speaker, Dr. Catherine Jones. Just a bit of background um, for you. Uh, Catherine has worked for Bug Life since 2017, where she joined uh, to deliver the Urban Buzz Project in Leeds. In her current role as pollinator officer uh, for Bug Life, she covers the whole of the UK, no mean feat. Um, and Catherine represents Bug Life or in pollinator groups and projects, including Get Cumbria Buzzing uh, and DEFRA's Pollinator Advisory Steering Group, and, and also farming groups such as Farm Wildlife and Nature Friendly Farming Networks. Okay, so if Catherine is there, I will pass you over. I'll just um, stop sharing. Um, Okay, and what I'll do, um, I'll ask Catherine to share her screen. If you want to unmute, unmute Catherine. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just trying to share my screen. I'll be with you in a minute. There you go. Slideshow, there you go. All right, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to uh, introduce Bug Life, talk to you about research findings on the impact of glyphosate or herbicides, particularly glyphosate, on pollinators and what we can do about it. 
So Bug Life. Bug Life is the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. We are Europe's only organisation devoted to the conservation of all invertebrates. And our mission is to stop the extinction of invertebrates to achieve sustainable populations. Our strap line, which I think is rather catchy, is saving the small things that run the planet. There is an urgent need for us to work to reverse insect declines and prevent insect extinctions. And to do this, Bug Life have a no insect extinction campaign. And uh, our three goals uh, to achieve this are making room for insects to thrive. So that's creating habitats as the Get Cumbria Buzzing project are doing. Provide safe spaces for insects to live in which is a pollutant free environment, which is what we're going to be focusing on this evening, this afternoon even, and develop friendly relationships with insects. So hopefully help you all to understand the importance of insects and how you can help um, to prevent the extinctions. So this is um, a little uh, image from a United Nations Environment Programme report entitled, We Are Losing the Little Things That Run the World. But insects provide a wide variety of essential services and in the middle you can see um, pollination. So today we are focusing on pollination and pollinators. Pollinating insects are really important. These include bees, butterflies, hoverflies and other insects and they're absolutely essential. They pollinate our crops, enabling us to produce the food we eat. They pollinate wildflowers bringing colour and life to the countryside. But insect pollination is essential to maintain a healthy, thriving natural environment. 80% of the wildflowers that we have in this country are pollinated by insects. Just to give you a little bit more background on the Bee Lines uh, project, because um, the Get Cumbia Browsing project does actually work along uh, the Bee Lines network in the northwest of Cumbria. Bee Lines is a pollinator recovery network, a network of wildflower rich insect superhighways, a landscape scale solution to reverse the declining pollinating insects, to identify opportunities for a national network of wildflower rich habitats, to reconnect our fragmented landscapes, and to make room for insects to thrive. Everyone can help contribute to the Bee Lines whether they're conservation organisations, local authorities, or government organisations or individuals, everybody can help and help our pollinators to thrive. So creating safe spaces for insects. So we like spaces that's both terrestrial land, um, habitats and fresh waters free from pollutants. This means free from pesticides, so that's insecticides and herbicides that we're concentrating on this afternoon, free from invasive species. Now, her pesticides include insecticides and herbicides. They are substances that kill organisms that are considered to be pests. This could be plant species or insect species in the case of insecticides. But they also have an impact on non-target species. And this is the real issue. So what are herbicides? Herbicides are chemical substances which suppress and usually eliminate plant growth. They're sometimes referred to as plant protection products. And this is because they're used to destroy unwanted vegetation and therefore protect wanted vegetation. And this wanted vegetation is usually crop species. Herbicides are used to control weeds in agricultural pests and invasive species. They have an impact on insects by de destroying plants. So in the images at the bottom of the slide, you can see some uh, willow herb on the left hand side, probably in somebody's garden or, uh, or an urban habitat and on the right alongside a rural road. So are, are these weeds really threatening us in any way? Could we not allow them to stay there to benefit pollinators?
So herbicides have an inter indirect impact on insects, particularly pollinators, by suppressing their food source. And at a time when floral resources for pollinating insects are limited, the impact of herbicides on wildflower availability in the UK is huge. Whatever the direct toxicity of a herbicide, their impact on the wildflower population is also going to impact the pollinating insects. So herbicides, when we think of herbicides, we generally think of the most commonly used herbicide um, in the world, actually, not just in the UK, in the world, and that is glyphosate. Glyphosate was um, originally manufactured by Monsanto, that is now part of Bayer, and it's commonly known by its original trade name, which is Roundup. Herbicides based on glyphosate are manufactured by many countries in many, many companies in many countries. They're probably carcinogenic. They're found in food products, water, wine, beer, human urine, breast milk, according to the Pesticide Action Network UK. But today I'd like to concentrate on the impact of these herbicides on pollinators. Bug life's position on the use of uh, pesticides generally. So bug life acknowledge that there are circumstances where particular species of plant, fungi, vertebrate or invertebrate can cause significant damage. Therefore appropriate pest management control is justified. Bug life is not for or against any generic type of pest control technique. Pest control should only be undertaken where the following conditions are met. There is a significant economic benefit to society, welfare benefit to animals, and or an environmental benefit from pest control. And the pest control technique does not cause significant damage to the environment. Bug life believes that it is essential that pest control techniques that risk causing damage to the environment are subject to a rigorous and independent authorization process. Control techniques should be applied using best practice techniques and standards, facilitated by high quality and regular training. All practitioners of pest control should be made aware of the integrated use of control techniques and how and when to apply them most effectively. So just as a quick overview of the impact of glyphosate more generally on invertebrates, Bug Life did a scientific review in 2016 and found that there were impacts in scientific research on a wide range of invertebrates including ground beetles, spiders, wood lice, flying, the common blue damselfly, freshwater crustaceans, aquatic invertebrates, earthworms, and honeybees. And honeybees is probably the area where there's most information. These tend to be the domesticated pollinators rather than wild pollinators. And more recently, there has been more research, particularly on earthworms that I've seen. But I'd like to talk to you about two recent pieces of research, both published this year. The first is entitled, Is Glyphosate Toxic to Bees? A Meta-Analytical Review. So this research reviewed scientific papers um, on the effect of glyphosate on bee mortality, published between 1945 and 2020 and concluded that glyphosate can be considered toxic to bees. But highlighted that research on the impacts of glyphosate on bees was still scarce for both lethal and sublethal effects. And it looked at glyphosate products rather than glyphosate purely um, as a chemical alone. So this is where the most recent piece of research, uh, which is particularly relevant, uh, comes into play. So 
So some research we also published this year by Ed Straw and colleagues. Roundup causes high levels of mortality following contact exposure in bumblebees. So Ed looked at the uh, mortality effects of spraying herbicides directly onto bumblebees. He used three Roundup products. One was actually called Roundup No Glyphosate and compared this to a different glyphosate product, Weedol. One of the glyphosate, the Roundup glyphosate products was a, an agricultural uh, product and uh, two of them uh, ready to use in the no glyphosate product were actually both consumer products. So theoretically you could go into a, a garden center or, or somewhere and buy these products. So when you see the results, that's quite shocking. So what did they find? They found that ready to use which is the consumer product, had a 94% mortality rate. The Roundup Proactive, which is the agricultural project, product, had a 30% mortality. And the Weedol, which was also glyphosate-based, had no significant mortality. Whereas the Roundup No Glyphosate had a 96% mortality rate. This study concluded that glyphosate Itself was not actually the cause of bumblebee mortality. It was actually the other chemicals in the uh, Roundup form formulation. The evidence of significant direct glyphosate mortalities in pollinators and other insects is rare. When mixed with other chemicals, glyphosate-based herbicides kill insects. There are also concerns about the sublethal effects that haven't been fully investigated and may cause long-term damage to insect populations. Things like the toxicity on uh, symbiotic bacteria that insects depend on to properly digest their food and create pupicles. So moving on to what we can do about it. Uh, well, we can follow the code of practice from the health and safety executive. This is the most recent uh, information I was able to find from DEFRA. Um, I actually found this on the uh, HSE website. And this was published in 2006. Uh, but DEFRA are currently working on a draft of the National Action Plan for the Sustainable Use of Pesticides. This draft actually was under consultation between uh, December and February this year, and DEFRA is still working on that. So hopefully we should see a new code of practice soon. So what can we do as organisations and individuals? We can put away the spray. Pesticides are chemicals designed to kill insects and plants. Both target species and others are affected. By eliminating or reducing our use of insecticides and herbicides, we can prevent the death of thousands of insects. So what else can we do? We can help bug life save the planet, reverse insect declines and prevent insect extinctions. We can create wildflower habitat for pollinators and record it on the beelines map, similar to the project that the Get Cumbria Buzz project are doing. We can make room for insects to thrive. We can reconnect the wild parts of our landscapes. We can create safe spaces for insects free from pollutants and invasive species. We can develop friendly relationships with insects. We consider the importance of insects in everything we do. And here are a few useful links to some of the bug life work. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, that's uh, abs absolutely fantastic and uh, incredibly enlightening about that new research about glyphosate. Uh, it's really throwing up some interesting data and yes we need further research don't we I think um, and all this needs to be fed into policy so um, thank you very much Catherine um, uh, without further ado I shall move on to our next next guest speaker uh, this this afternoon who is um, Barnaby Coop who is the policy and information officer at the Wildlife Trust um, so what I'll do um, 
I'll just uh, uh, add that uh, I'll just give you a bit of background. So working within the central office of the Wildlife Trusts, Barnaby is involved in the national policy development for chemical and pesticide use in the UK. Uh, drawn together the knowledge and experience from practitioners and researchers across the 46 wildlife trusts to inform our advocacy work. Um, so hopefully Barnaby will uh, unmute himself and make himself known. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for the introduction. That's great. And if I uh, hand over the, the controls to you so you can share your screen. Yeah. Hopefully you can all see that now. Ooh. Yep. Yeah, brilliant. I've seemed to have frozen on my screen. Uh, so that, yeah, we've got a bit of a freeze here as well. Right, I will see if that's going to rectify itself. Although, oh, there you go. Should, it, can you see my screen? You can hear Not me. Yet. Yeah. Right, well, we can hear you, we can see you, but we can't see the screen. So you might need to just maybe come out of it and try again. There we go. Yeah, we've yep, got you. Got it now. That's it. All sorted. Brilliant. That's great. Great. Um, I should just first of all start off by saying good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Tanya, for setting up this event. Um, really interesting talk, Catherine, especially that recent um, research on glyphosate. Um, I have had my COVID jab this morning, so if I start to fade in the next couple of, uh, couple of minutes, that will be why, but I've been reliably informed that it's good to keep your fluids up, so if I'm drinking water, that's why. Um, but as Tanya introduced, I work in the central policy team at the Wildlife Trusts, working on um, chemical and pesticide uh, policy and advocacy on a UK scale. Um, and today I'll be talking about the Wildlife Trust's position on pesticide use. So how big an issue is pesticide use in the UK? Pesticides have been used in agriculture for centuries, but over recent decades, there's been an exponential growth in synthetic chemical use. Government policy has incentivized a model of farming which is based on increasing food production through high yield for seed varieties and pesticides. So since 1990, not only has the area of land being treated with pesticides increased by about 63%, but both the toxicity and the frequency of applications of pesticides has increased too. This was ordered in 2016, over 6,500 tons of pesticides were used to kill British farms, were used to kill weeds and insects on British farms. I'm using these data because these, the, the only information we have available is for agricultural use. This doesn't even begin to cover the chemicals used in our cities, on our gardens, or for other land use sectors, such as forestry. Many of these pesticides are commonly applied, often several times a year, through broad, often non-specific application methods, such as boom spray. This combination has resulted in vast quantity of chemicals being applied spread across the landscape with the outcome being a dangerous accumulation of chemicals in our soils, our waterways, and our coastal waters. Not only does this lead to greater concentrations of individual chemicals, but there's also a growing body of evidence that pesticides can become more harmful when combined, a phenomenon known as the, uh, the cocktail effect. Many of the active ingredients in these pesticides can persist in the environment for days and weeks, and even when they do start to break down, the resultant products can have further negative impacts on wildlife. A good example of this is what Catherine just talked about with Edward Straw's research, um, which showed that the surfactants and other co-formulants used in Roundup products may or may be linked to insect death. So it's not just the active ingredients in these chemicals which we need to look out for. Um, and finally, many of these pesticides are freely available to be used by untrained members of the public, which can further lead to pesticides becoming present in higher doses or within vulnerable environments such as waterways. So I won't go into this in too much detail because I know Catherine's just covered it, but insecticides by their very nature are specifically designed to kill or actively reduce the numbers of insects where applied. Even exposure to tiny doses of these pesticides can have complex and unpredict unpredictable impacts on insect behavior. Wider pesticides such as herbicides don't, don't directly target insects, but indirectly harm them by killing their food plants, fragmenting habitats, and changing complex habitats where nature can thrive into more simple monocultures. There are also impacts further up the food chain, as a collapse in insect populations also reduces food availability for a range of mammals, amphibians, reptiles and birds. Recent reports for the Wildlife Trust suggest that the abundance of insects has declined by as much as 50% in the UK since 1970, with the use of pesticides and other pollutants one of the key drivers for this decline. 
pesticides applied to land eventually accumulate in waterways. This is where insecticide pollution has led to massive invertebrate fatalities in the freshwater environment. And then of course, these ultimately end up in our seas. The impact of pesticides in our seas is not yet fully understood. Although several chemicals are known to be toxic to marine wildlife at even very low concentrations, the long-term impacts on our seas from pesticide use in the UK is likely far greater than we know. So this leaves us with three key issues. The first of this being that insect abundance has declined. In 2019, UK MPs declared an environment and climate emergency, stating that the loss of biodiversity constitutes a real and present threat to our future. The catastrophic decline in insects is a live demonstration of this dual emergency, and one of the primary drivers of this loss is the routine and widespread use of pesticides. Insects are a critical part of all terrestrial and freshwater food webs and provide vital ecosystem services such as pollinating crops, controlling pests, forming soil, and recycling nutrients. The second issue is that while pro-pesticide lobby groups have claimed pesticide use in the UK has halved since 1990, this refers only to the total weight of pesticides applied. In reality, the area of land treated, the toxicity of the pesticides used, and the frequency of their application have all increased. And for decades, pesticide use in the UK has been largely regulated by the European Union. As the UK leaves the, leaves the EU, it is critical, critical that we address this issue. Failure to act could risk not just our food security, but widespread ecological collapse. So, good news is, is that it's not too late to reverse declines in biodiversity loss if we start now, but we need transformative change. The wildlife trusts are campaigning to reduce the impact of pesticide use and challenge the concept that pesticides are the go-to management option in a wide variety of cases. We want to see a significant reduction in pesticide use, which is urgently needed to reverse insect declines, improve human health, and create a wilder future. Failure to do this risks the collapse of our insect populations. We want to see a commitment to the phasing out of pesticides where their uses are necessary, and for chemicals known to have significant environmental and human health risks to be phased out. We also want to see integrated pest management, an approach to managing pests, diseases, or weeds in which chemical pesticides are only used as a last resort at the heart of pest management regulation in the UK, with support for land managers to transition away from chemicals. And finally, following our departure from the EU, it's imperative that the UK maintains current protections from pesticide related harms and continues to follow the precautionary principle where there is uncertainty over levels of risk. We recognise that there will be situations where the use of chemicals remains the only viable solution to overcoming certain challenges. For example, the, uh, the control of invasive alien species like Japanese knotweed. In these cases where chemicals are the last viable solution, their use should be proportionate and follow good practice to minimise the impacts on the environment. We know that change can be difficult. Rather than condemn those who struggle with it or even resist it, Wildlife Trusts are committed to helping businesses and individuals reduce and ultimately phase out their pesticide use. We will only achieve required scale of change if we work together. So that's me, Tanya. That's fantastic. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen again. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. That was incredibly enlightening, actually. And I'll just... Uh, just uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to stop. Right, I don't know if you can see me, everyone. Um, there we go. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Barnaby. That clearly demonstrated the serious effect that herbicides and pesticides are having on our pollinators. Some um, quite staggering data there about the impact. Um, and the staggering decline of pollinators in the last 50 years, since the 1970s, 50% of our pollinators are showing rapid decline, um, and part of this is because pesticides. So um, uh, a clear message there as well is that underlying all this moving forward is good practice. And I'll move on to our uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barnaby. Um, I'll move on to Chloe O'Hare from um, Highways England. Um, so Chloe, if we are, if you're with us now, okay. hello, that's fantastic. Uh, and just to give a, a bit of background uh, for Chloe, uh, Chloe um, is Highways England Northwest Asset Delivery Environment Team Manager. Uh, Chloe is based in Penrith in Northwest Cumbria. 
uh, and her and her team manages and maintains all motorways and trunk roads within Cumbria, Lancashire, Cheshire, Merseyside and Manchester. Uh, Chloe has over 15 years of experience working on the verges across Cumbria and Lancashire, delivering improvement schemes, managing soft estate asset, developing surveys and inspection programmes, raising environmental awareness and balancing safety with environmental gains. Um, Highways England are one of Get Cumbria Buzzing's project partners and funders, um, and Chloe's here today to um, give an insight of, uh, of her work at Highways England and uh, their approach to, to herbicides. Thank you. I'll just uh, share the screen because I have um, Chloe's presentation here. Uh, right. Thanks. Can everyone hear me all right? Is the, the audio okay? Good, good, good. Thank you. Um, so I, thanks very much for, for inviting and for those of you who are attending today. Um, that's great. I'm really interested to hear what the other speakers are saying. And I think there's lots that we can connect up on with this, which will be really good. Um, I won't say anything else about myself. Tanya's covered that nicely and, and five minutes isn't very long. So we'll we'll crack on. Um, can you go on to the next slide, please, Tanya? Uh, right. I just it was. It was working earlier. Let's just see if I can move on. I do apologise. OK, I just stopped share and I just might need to come back into it. So just, just bear with me. Let's go back. Always works in rehearsal and then not it, in the real thing. I know. I do <laughs> apologise. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we are. So just a slide um, about what I'm going to talk about. So a bit about who we are as Highways England why we need to control weeds, um, how we do that, and a bit about how we have to balance our decisions between safety and environment, which is something in my job I seem to be doing all the time. Um, and then uh, I think the questions are at the end of the whole session, aren't they, Tanya? I've got a slide at the end with, with um, some references on as well. So next slide, please, Tanya. So a bit about who we are. So Highways England operates, maintains and improves all the motorways and the trunk roads in England. And that equates to 4,300 miles of strategic road network across the country. Um, the part of that network that I look after that I'm kind of most interested in is the environmental assets. And most of those are usually either side of the hard standing. So the bit that you see on the verges up to the boundary fence. And that part we call the soft estate. So the soft estate um, of Highways England is actually over 30,000 hectares across, across the country. And that does make us one of the biggest landowners in England. So that fact is, is quite surprising to some people because we just drive past these parts. You know, we just drive on the road and... These, these greenery flashes by, but it actually adds up to, to quite a lot of land altogether. Um, the part that I look after in the Northwest asset delivery is about 2000 hectares. So just to put that in perspective as, as my patch. And we have actually found um, and recorded in the time that I've been here, we've recorded over 500 plant and tree species on our network here in the Northwest. So we do have quite a good idea of what we've got out there um, and, and managing our data is obviously a key thing for us as well. Highways England as a company, we have um, an environment strategy, we have targets, um, we have five year programmes for investment, um, some of which involves designated funding for the environment. So that's where the Get Cumbia Buzzing project has come from. And we've worked closely in partnership with the Wildlife Trust to appear to deliver that project. Um, there's lots of information on our website about all of those things. But obviously today I'm, I'm here to talk about our approach to weeds. So next slide, please, Tanya. Um, this is about why we need to control weeds. So as we know, as, as a lot of people all know, um, we have an obligation as a landowner to control injurious weeds and to stop the spread of those that's under the Weeds Act. And also to stop the spread of non-native and invasive species as well. But as an asset owner um, and also um, thinking about our road users and stakeholders and also our road workers and operatives, um, we do need to make sure that we maintain a safe and serviceable network. So 
Highways England, um, one of our top priorities is safety, but also top priority is our, our customers, road users, uh, making sure we have smooth journeys and that we're looking after the roads so that they can be used into the future and we have a program of works to make sure that we're keeping them safe and serviceable. So in order to develop those programs of work, we need to be able to inspect our assets um, and look at the condition and to be able to see any damage. And in order to do that, um, we often need to control weeds um, and make to make sure that we can actually see our structures, for example, or our drainage features, our gullies. Um, so we do need to control weeds in order to make sure we can manage the network. Next slide, please, Tanya. A bit about how we do that. Um, essentially for us, once a road is operational, so that's once it's actually there and being used, um, we really only have two options to control weeds. Um, one is pulling. So we do use that option for ragwort and for Himalayan balsam. And the other is spraying with herbicide, which we usually use that option for Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed and sometimes ragwort. I'll, I'll come on in another slide to talk about decisions behind that. Um, we also spray hard standing and structures, as I mentioned before, to make sure that we can access them and see them clearly on our routine inspections that we carry out. More recently, we have introduced a, a low nutrient grassland policy. So this means that we're actually, um, we're not importing any topsoil anymore onto new roads and bypasses. Um, and the idea there is that we are essentially reducing weed growth from the start and, and hopefully that will provide a more long-term solution so we could actually avoid having to use or control weeds in the long term. Um, Next, oh, I should have just said, all the photos on the slides are from our network. Um, and if anyone wants to know a bit more about projects on our network, then I can, I can uh, update them on that in the questions. Um, next slide, please, Tanya. Um, this is just a slide I put together to try and explain um, the kind of balance of decisions that we, that we have to make. As I said, Highways England, our top priority is safety, and that's road workers as well as, as customers, and also providing smooth journeys. So the blue boxes here are um, points that could, you could consider generally to be more preferable outcomes, and the yellow ones are less preferable. So as you can see on the, on the pulling side of the, uh, of the slide, there are actually more compromising factors there for us. Um, it involves more manual handling. Um, it tends to mean more time needed to carry out the job, which means more cones on the road, which means more exposure to live traffic. And if anyone's ever broken down or worked on, on the verges, you'll know that that is not a safe place to be. Um, and obviously it is our top priority to avoid um, that being necessary. Um, but obviously spraying does come with disadvantages as we've hearing about today as well. So for us, I think our main um, policy point on this and approach is that we would be interested in knowing what other options there are that are approved and as, as safe and as efficient um, as the current herbicides that we do use are. Um, next slide, please, Tanya. I think that might be it for me. Yep, so there's reference, some reference materials there. Um, and I can provide some more as well if we're sharing the slides. Um, and a nice picture there, I think of bird's eye primrose at, on the M6 verge, um, just to share as a last photo, but that's, that's it for me. And yeah, really glad to be here today and interested to see, um, see what we get in discussions as well. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Chloe, and uh, fantastic slides. And, and thank you for that insight. Um, we've heard about the effects of herbicides on pollinators, but it's really good to get an insight into the, uh, the practical issues surrounding uh, the ongoing maintenance of, of, of safety along our roadside verges and our highways. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate your input there, Chloe. Right, I shall move on now to our next guest speaker, um, uh, who is Julian Smith. Julian Smith, um, uh, for, who is the Parks and Open Space Officer for Allerdale Borough Council. Um, 
uh, Aldale Borough Council are also one of our Get Cumbia Buzzing project partners. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, Julian hasn't got slides for us because he'll be speaking directly. Um, so I shall hand you over now to Julian if you'd like to unmute um, and introduce yourself a bit further. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, I'll just say a little bit about bit more about myself. I, I'm, as Tanya said, Parks and Open Spaces Officer for Aladelborough Council. And a part of my role is to um, oversee the grounds maintenance contract um, for the council's land holding and also quite a lot of land that we maintain but don't own. Uh, and we do that um, through largely through um, an externally sourced contract with um, our partners Tivoli, who are going to be the next speaker, I think, uh, uh, as part of the, this session. So I want, I, I want to focus a little bit more, probably uh, less, less on the technical side of what's been talked about so far, and maybe a little bit more about the sort of peculiar challenges that maybe local authorities face um, in terms of um, policy and communication with the public. Um, so, I mean, I think we all recognise, don't we, that there's a growing concern um, about the harm that pesticides are causing to our environment. And that's been highlighted, as we know, through the recent alarming decline, declines in bee and other pollinator species in the UK, which is our reason for being here today. And we've, we've, we've heard already uh, in previous uh, talks about um, what's happening in that respect. Um, however, th there is a growing pesticide free towns movement um, in the UK, which is seeing more and more local level campaigns being started by people concerned about pesticide use. And in 2018, there were approximately, I think, about 50 pesticide free town campaigns running nationwide. And I would imagine that that number has increased probably significantly in the last couple of two or three years since then. So I think because of the, the concern and the growing interest, there, there is clearly an onus on local authorities to respond. Um, but obviously we as local authorities and land managers are only one of many land managers, landowners with that responsibility. But I do think it's right that local authorities should be seen as being a driving force. And as well as getting in our own, you know, our own house in order, we should be involving multiple stakeholders to make that drive towards becoming pesticide free as far as possible, uh, as comprehensive as possible. Working in that way, we can hopefully influence market forces. Now, if more councils require a pesticide free approach or a largely pesticide free approach from their contractors, then increasing numbers of contractors will have to provide that service and they'll invest in the necessary technology to do so. Uh, and over time, this will make non-chemical approaches that much easier and cheaper. And ultimately, you know, they'll become the norm rather than the exception. Financial considerations obviously come into play for councils, but um, with the costs of non-pesticide maintenance close to, or in some cases, potentially less than the chemical approach, then the other, and combined with the other non-chemical, no, sorry, non-financial benefits being so high, you know, it should in theory be a win-win approach for everyone. Um, I think it's fair to say that all council, uh, all, all local authority officers working in parks and open spaces and grounds maintenance and other environmental departments are supportive of the idea of reducing their use of pesticides. I think one of the factors that prevents a more focused and, and rapid move towards pesticide reduction is the challenge of communication and the impact that it would almost certainly have on staff time and resources. Um, through increased use of social media in recent years and apps, we've made or we've enabled the public uh, to report issues much more easily than ever before. And in recent years, it's become a bit of a free for all, to be quite honest. And speaking from my, my own personal experience at Alladelborough Council, which I'm sure is fairly typical, many council officers now spend an inordinate amount of time responding to inquiries, reports and complaints from the public. And from a grounds maintenance perspective, these kind of reports often relate to weeds and long grass. Often such complaints will come via councillors and sometimes you know, the local MP in response to inquiries that are submitted directly to the MP's office. As a consequence, I think there's a tendency for the development of policies and implementation of practical measures not to make it to the top of the to-do pile. And again, from personal experience, there have been occasions where we've initiated changes with a view to improving biodiversity on some of our sites, which have maybe historically been managed 
as you know, green desert, following requests from some residents, only to be met with a backlash from other residents that have been used to land being managed in a certain way and who want it to remain that way. So I think, you know, because of those kinds of instances, we've learned our lessons about the communication, you know, the importance of communication uh, with the public. But that consultation process with the public can be very time intensive, which makes initiating change quite a, quite a major challenge. So with that in mind, it becomes even more imperative that councils have in place a clear strategy for going pesticide free that sets a clear direction of travel from the outset and allows stakeholders, you know, concerned citizens, businesses, other land managers to play a part. And um, you know, this kind of approach will, 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 will help not only those involved in reducing the, the use of pesticides, but also assist residents and the wider public to understand the benefits of going pesticide free or significantly reducing. So I think you know, um, pesticide, going pesticide free can seem like a really daunting challenge, um, but I think we have to bear in mind that there is a, a long history of towns and cities throughout the world switching to non-chemical methods. And there are some great examples out there from which we can learn. Um, I just want to touch on a few, you know, a couple of circumstances and locations where we control presents a particular challenge. And some of these have been alluded to already by, by Chloe in particular. Um, there is a serious concern for local authorities and green space managers. Um, about the legal requirements and, and health and safety issues associated with invasive species such as Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, and they, they certainly need to be controlled and, and, and eradicated if possible. If invasive species are not managed responsibly, it is possible that under the Infrastructure Act 2015, a species control order can be handed to a, a landowner, which can then incur significant costs. Um, but we must remember also that there are non-chemical alternatives available, such as electronic weed control systems that kill stems and roots rather, you know, rather effectively and quickly. However, if the council does plan to, or if councils do plan to continue using pesticides to deal with invasive species, um, then we should be adopting techniques that keep the use of herbicides to a minimum. Stem injection being, you know, one, one good example of that. This is a technique that can be used on, on Japanese knotweed in particular, but also on other hollow stemmed invasive species. And because the herbicide is injected rather than uh, directly into the stem, rather than being um, applied as a, a foliar spray, it reduces the amount of pesticide being used and reduces the possibility of any spray drift onto adjacent areas. We have a particular site in Allerdale in, in the town of Maryport on the coast called Fleming Square. Uh, which is an old Georgian square surrounded by Georgian housing. It's about 80 metres by 40 metres in, in, in size. So it's a fairly sizable town square, surfaced largely with cobbles. And as you can imagine, the joints between the cobbles get infested with weeds and moss very quickly, you know, within literally a matter of, you know, weeks, you, you see the transformation. It's just an example of the kind of site that is really difficult to maintain by any other means than, than, than chemical control. Um, just the sheer practicalities of it would make it very difficult. I'm not, so I'm not ruling it out, but I'm saying at the moment we haven't got a better solution. And in that situation at the moment, we'll continue to adopt that, that spray, uh, that, that herbicide based approach. So in summary, going pesticide free is definitely desirable. Clearly it's achievable over a long period of time, probably, but certainly not straightforward. Lots of issues need to be addressed and often these issues impact significantly across the local authority area from community to community. However, to conclude, it's clear that, any, um, that for any pesticide free plan to work, there are three key requirements. One, support from the public. Two, political support from councillors. And three, a willingness to think long term. Local residents may be the source of many of our challenges, but they are also our greatest allies. So communicating effectively with them is absolutely vital as we drive forward change. That's me done, thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Some words of wisdom there. Um, it's yeah, very much about engaging your local communities. And, and, and can I just ask, uh, is this a consideration that Allerdale Borough Council is having of going potentially pesticide free? Well, put it like this, 
we, we haven't even got a, a pesticide policy yet. So I think <laughs> that's the first step. But like, like I said, it's a, it, you have to think long term, don't you? So, I mean, that, that's got to be the long term aim, at, at, at the very least, a very, very significant reduction. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, some really useful insights there, Gudin, of, you know, what what is issues arise, arise for you and the implications of, of not using herbicides as well and um, and raising the point about looking for alternatives. Um, and at that, this moment in time, I'm going to say thank you very much, Gudin, and I, we're going to move on to our next guest speaker. Uh, this afternoon, who is Ricky Andrews, uh, who is a compliance manager who looks after HSEQ, which is Health, Safety, Quality and the Environment for Tivoli Limited. Um, so, Ricky, would you mind just showing yourself and unmuting and um, uh, we sure. welcome you. Can you all see me? <laughs> yes, we can, Ricky. Thanks Thank for you. coming along. Um, I would... Um, just like to talk around um, uh, a few points from obviously from a contractor's perspective um, around how we we manage and we use pesticides. Um, obviously, you, you'll hear me refer to pesticides quite commonly. I think, as Catherine pointed out, that's a generic term for herbicide, fungicide, insecticides. Primarily, as a business we use herbicide, we don't use fungicide, we don't use insecticide. Um, and again, in relation to the customers that we work for and work with, we would much rather take an approach of um, not using any sort of pesticide. Um, we'd much rather have natural sort of habitat. So for example, wild flower meadows, um, we've actually planted them and introduced those for some local authorities. Um, and with other clients and other customers, um, we've actually generated different sorts of habitats. So in, instead of taking materials, mainly um, trees, things like that, where we remove trees, um, we'll actually build habitats um, within their, their premises for bugs and pollinators to use. Um, but generally, we start talking about the, the herbicide use. Um, as a business, we operate um, with a single supplier, which is a company called Agrigem. And we purchase all products um, through Agrigem so that it gives overall control of those products. Um, we don't just go and order things ourselves. Everything is um, discussed with Agrigen, um, best product. Um, predominantly that is glyphosate, but it's what we refer to as a clean label glyphosate. Um, going back to something Catherine mentioned um, when she was talking about Roundup and weed oil, different products like that. It tends to be with non-clean label products, the, the, the actual product has other substances within it. Sometimes that is preferred by contractors because the overall crop cost of the product to use a product is cheaper. Um, we only use a product called Gallup High Active, um, which is pure glyphosate. Uh, it's clean label, no other products in there. Um, again, control of the products, quantity and type, um, that's all held by Agrigem. So we don't have, we order in bulk, but that product is held centrally by Agrigem. So it's only released in very small amounts as that product is required. So you may get 10, 20 litres of product go out to a site from a central storage area um, that, that's held by Agrigem. Um, and that, that's partly to control the product, but also to control spillages or other emergencies that may arise um, in relation to that, that product being on site, fires, um, spillages, those sort of things. Um, also with Agrigem, they act as in the capacity of our basis registered advi advisors. 
So again, this comes back to we we don't just go and buy what we want to use. We ask what is the best product. Um, Agrogen will look at that. They will consider all the different factors, um, how that affects the environment, um, how that will affect wildlife, um, insects, those sort of things. They will give us the best product for dealing with a target species. Um, and again, I think when Julian was speaking, he mentioned different sorts of invasive species, Japanese knotweed, um, giant hogweed. We do manage a lot of areas um, that, that have Japanese knotweed within them. And again, we don't spray those sort of species. Um, it, it, it's not a practical approach. The, the best way to, to control that species is by stem injection. So what that does is reduces the amount of pesticide, or, or in this case herbicide, applied to the local area. Um, all of the products we use, they, they don't come from places like B&Q. There's a lot of horrendous products you can buy, um, certainly at B&Q, that have um, quite drastic um, effects on the environment. Um, we don't use any of them. There's a very, very strict control process and approval process um, around substances. It goes, any substance that anyone wants to use goes through an approval process, um, which includes Agrogem, uh, the regional manager and the regional director um, before it, it, it finally comes to me for approval. All of the products are on an approved product listing. And what that means is no product that isn't on that listing can be used. And that's all controlled by a central database that everyone um, has access to. So all of the COSH information, all of the COSH data um, is, is within that database. Um, transportation, again, wherever practical, will move any sort of herbicide in a diluted state. Um, we tend to avoid using concentrates um, by taking them out to site, unless there's a specific, a specific sort of reason. Um, I've mentioned clean label products whenever practical, that's the first choice. We do look at alternative methods um, other than just going in and using herbicide. We will we'll look at cutting back um, with, with machinery. That to us is, is the best choice. Um, obviously, with the use of pesticides, it's a very, very high level of training, which is PA1, PA6. Um, that's done through MPTC, so there's no other real qualification that we accept. Um, that can take quite a, quite a time to get someone qualified for that. Um, so potentially you could have turnover of staff where you get someone trained and then you, you lose that person. Um, got extensive guidance available to operators. So these are things like the local environmental risk assessment um, for pesticides. Um, guidance on the use of pesticides, control of pesticides, storage, etc. And the business in general is uh, amenity assured and accredited. So it's not just us saying we, we do all of these things um, to, to keep people safe, to keep the environment safe. It, it's actually audited by an independent company um external auditors come in and carry out surveillance checks on us as a business to ensure that we are following and sticking to to what we're actually saying um pretty much that's it from me tom yeah it was just to give everyone an overview of, of what we do as a contractor thank you ricky um that's fantastic and again another insight from inside the industry if you like the the people out there actually look you know actually targeting our different uh, weeds um and using different methods of control and it, it's really good to see and hear that there's so many policies in place um so that you know we can deal with injurious weeds in a way that's um you know uh, that's been overseen by um a statutory body if you like or just, you know just making sure that 
uh, everyone's clear about the way they use herbicides uh, and it's not just blanket spraying and going out there um, and just you know and also looking at other approaches such as cutting back um, and planting meadows that you spoke about earlier. Okay uh, well we've had a wide range of guest speakers today thank you everyone uh, for, for um, joining us today. Now, we have um, an opportunity for questions from our audience. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, if they'd like to stick in the chat box, or um, if anyone would like to maybe raise their hand, we've only got, we've got uh, enough people, I think, in the audience that we can probably raise our hands uh, and people can actually chat directly if you want. Um, so uh, let's just have a look and just see uh, if anyone has any questions they'd like to share or if indeed any of our, our guest speakers today have anything else they want to add or whether they'd like to um, share any questions or ask any questions of each other indeed while you're sat around the table. I've got one, Tanya. Go ahead, Ricky. Which was um, just coming back to um, what Julian um, was, was, was speaking around. Um, and that is, I think, it, the, the use of pesticides is, is by far too commonplace. But the only way we will change that uh, as a group is to look at it um, as a cultural sort of change. Um, depending on where you are, whether it's parks, it's open spaces, whether it's a, a blue chip, high profile site, everybody has a different um, opinion and approach. Um, but we can change that. We, you know, we, we don't really want to use pesticides, but obviously to use alternative methods requires investment. And it's only when we get enough customers and clients that, that say they want to change that. I think someone mentioned politicians, councillors, same sort of thing. Once we get enough people that say they want to change that, I think, you know, certainly us as a business, we're more than ready um, to, change, to change that and take the, the pesticides out of the equation um, and look at alternative methods. You know, we do work quite closely with suppliers uh, and manufacturers, but certainly alternative methods of, of dealing with something we control from our point of view um, would be great. Okay, thank you, uh, Ricky. Yes, so it looks like you are receptive to change, um, but that calls upon um, people to actually shout louder. Um, right, we've got a few hands up now, and I've also got a, a, um, a message in the, um, yeah, the chat box. Um, we've got coming in. So I work for Cumbria County Council. Would like would be interested in working with other organisations regarding alternative solutions for policies, if they would be happy to do so. Um, so that's um, from uh, Annette Wilkinson. So there's a call out um, for looking at uh, different alternative solutions. Um, we also have um, a message. Uh, a question how often do incidents occur when contractors are non-compliant with guidance produced by local authorities how is England and Tivoli limited and how are these dealt with would any one of you like to take that so Julian or Chloe uh, would either of you two like to take that I can Julian? say something on that um, I mean, obviously, I don't know nationally for Highways England how often non-compliance incidents occur um, what I can say for us in the northwest is that we do have quite a stringent um, contract set up. So we only have approved contractors and method statements set up for the use of weeds and we collect all the weed sheets and everything from our maintenance contractor. Um, and we do carry out audits and issue non-compliance if we do find any, um, any non-compliance. <laughs> Um, which we haven't found from our from our current contractor. Um, but I do think it's a good point there because it is quite hard for us as organisations to have our eyes on the ground at every single thing that's happening out on the network. So obviously we do what we can um, and in terms of our contracts and how they're set up. But I think obviously the aim here from this discussion group is to try and 
reduce the use of pesticides in the first place. So um, I think that's something that we can we can focus on. But yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can't say a number of, of incidents, um, but obviously it's it's all about following the manufacturer's instructions and legislation, and that's in our contracts. So there is an element of contractor competency there. And I have noticed there is uh, one of our contractors on the call, I think, from uh, from ground control, which is great. But we do, yeah, we, we need contractors to be competent and, and they go through our our processes to be procured and be competent to carry out the work that we're asking them to do. So there's an element of reliability on that, really. Thank you, Chloe. Chloe, Julian, do you want to just add? Chip in I, mean, I, would, I just concur with what, what Chloe just said. I mean, it, it's um, I can't I can't actually recall the last incident of non-compliance from, from one of our contractors. It was currently obviously it's Tivoli. Prior to them, it was it was ISS, and uh, you know, I mean, just very good generally, I would say. Um, what we do get as a local authority is often reports from the public identifying non-compliance on um, sites that aren't our responsibility and where our contractor hasn't been involved. And, um, you know, nothing to do with us. And we have to just make that point to the, to the, the customer. Um, but it, it clearly does happen out in the wide world. Non-compliance non does go on. And I think more often than not, it is just inappropriate spraying or poor use of herbicide um, control. So excessive spray, spray use, um, not, not necessarily, you know, um, clearly enough targeting the, 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 um, the target area. Mm -hmm. that, that, that happens a fair bit. Okay, yeah, thank you, Julian. Uh, and maybe going towards a pesticide free local authority may help with, uh, you know, sort of curb that potentially. Okay, we have a hand up um, from Stuart, and then we have one more hand up. I mean, a couple more messages, uh, but then we really will need to wrap up because we're over time already. So, very quickly, um, Stuart, you have your hand up if you are yep. like to un unmute. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Thank, uh, thanks for everyone for a really good talk. Um, yeah, just sort of um, wondering how does something like weed wiping compare when uh, applying um, herbicides compare with the likes of spraying in relation to environmental damage and cost, etc. Good question. Um, is that something Catherine you would know about or Barnaby? I can talk to a little bit, but not from a practitioning point, not from a practitioner point of view myself, but certainly from a survey we, we've conducted of chemical users. Um, the difference, main difference between spraying and weed wiping is kind of the aerial presence of the chemical. So, I, I mean, they're good, good practice for chemical use to say you shouldn't apply spray, spraying on a windy day. But obviously weed wiping, you're directly applying the chemical from the from where you're applying it onto the vegetation as opposed to spraying it in the air. So you haven't got that medium in between the two. Um, but it is a, it's a real spectrum going from, you know, at one end you've kind of, you've got some chemicals which are applied through aerial sprays right through to stem injection. So again, it's all along that spectrum. You're moving from non-specific to more specific approaches. Uh, but Catherine, I don't know whether you have anything further to add. I, I, it, it's Rick, I've just got a point on that. I think it, a lot of it is dependent upon the, the type of target species you're trying to treat. Um, I, was, I think we were talking about other contractors a little bit earlier on. Um, if you were treating something like ivy that's got a, a shiny leaf, it's not very receptive um, to the, the, the pesticide you're applying. So you tend to have to use, um, you put another chemical in to that mix that makes it stick. Um, but what tends to happen with things like ivy is people feel they're potentially killing the ivy by applying more of the chemical, when in actual fact you're not. Um, just coming back to wiping, same sort of thing. You, wherever that, with the professional substances, the professional products, wherever that makes contact with the target species, it will kill that target species. So it only effectively has to touch two leaves. You don't have to absolutely saturate something and spray something to get penetration enough to kill that, that target species. It, it depends purely 
what that species is. Yeah. So I think like they've got a soft, soft sort of leaf. Um, if they've got a foliage on the leaf, uh, or hair growth, something like that, the, the chemical will stick or adhere a lot better. As soon as it dries, um, I would say 99% of them uh, don't have any effect to anything else. They're not harmful to animals or children once they've been applied. But I think that's a misconception, especially with, with smaller contractors. And say, I work for Tivoli, we're quite a large business. I can't afford to take that risk of um, overdosing on chemicals or using the wrong chemical. We've got to be top notch, 100% on it all the time. Whereas a smaller contractor may take the choice to use a herbicide that's got maybe two or three other products in it, and it comes at a third of the cost of the professional product. So I think that's where the, the, the problem may arise with that. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, does that answer your question, Stuart? Uh, yeah, I, I did, was Catherine gonna say something as well? Uh, yes, I was gonna say that um, uh, Barnaby and Ricky covered most things fairly well there, in my opinion. The only thing I would add is that it would depend a great deal on the substances used in the weed wipe. As Ricky mentioned, you, it's the additional substances that are used to break down the cuticle of the plant, which, yeah, are, are the things that are causing the problems. Um, so if it's if it's it depends on the chemicals involved in the weed wipe as well as the species of plant that you're applying it to. All right. Right, brilliant. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. That was quite a comprehensive uh, answer from everyone. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think actually that's probably answered one of the questions that's also in the chat box, which is actually to Ricky uh, saying, how uh, representative are you as a contractor when compared to others in the industry? And I think you've actually answered that when you said that, that smaller contractors might not have the same or uh, might, uh, might not adhere to the same sort of costs or they might be regulated more by cost than, than you are and uh, and you know your compliance so you might not be a representative per se of the environment of the actual industry um so what i think i'll do if there's no other questions or hands up um i'll just say that there is a, a website that Julian's highlighted and also Catherine has highlighted uh, about alternatives to herbicide use. It's called panuk.org alternative to herbicides. It's been posted in the chat box. So um, there are alternatives out there. Um, and I think that for me, um, this webinar has been incredibly useful. Um, just to summarize, We've seen and heard about the effects of herbicides and other pesticides on pollinators. Uh, we know about the staggering decline of pesticides. And I think that we can see there's a clear evidence that there is a call for action uh, to help reverse the decline of pollinators. And one thing that we can do is look to alternatives for the herbicides that we use already. So that's uh, to really push um, that directive up the ladder. But in the meantime, to look at best practice approaches. And some of those have been shared today. It's really good to hear from Tivoli and the best practice approaches that they use, um, that they are compliant and there's lots of evidence out there that other organizations are moving to really stringent uh, compliant usages. Um, we've also heard from Julian how there is um, a desire from local authorities um, to move potentially towards pesticide free um, local authorities and, and council areas. Um, and there's an increasing demand that um, uh, Barnaby raised about the general public want to see that. I myself, uh, I, I've worked very closely with Chloe um, on Highways England Soft Estate, um, and we get a lot of inquiries through Cumbia Wildlife Trust about people who, who want a better place for nature, who don't want herbicides, don't want pesticides, who even you know, don't want areas cut. Uh, they recognize the benefits that nettles, docks, thistles provide for our pollinators. Um, so there is a desire um, and hopefully this webinar has raised some certain 
you know, thoughts going forward about what we can do. And if anyone's interested about getting in touch about, you know, thinking about further what we can do about the use of herbicides and getting the message out there uh, and maybe setting up, um, you know, some sort of forum, um, then please do get in touch. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything at this stage from our guest speakers. Um, okay, well, I will just take this opportunity to thank all our guest speakers. It's been uh, a fantastic, a real insight, um, a lot of knowledge to take away there and chew the fat on. We are recording this uh, webinar, so please uh, feel free to share it widely um, with colleagues. It will be uploaded to YouTube and available from our website. Um, but thank you most of all the audience here today. I hope you found it useful. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, I look forward to hearing from anyone who wants to get in contact. Um, so thank you very much um, and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye, -bye.